Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We appreciate your presence. Welcome every one of you. We have a few visitors. We're delighted to have you in the service today. May the Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping the hour coming up we can be an inspiration to everyone. Now you can get this morning's entire program, singing and message, on cassette tape. It'll be tape number 196. Tape number 196. I'm speaking on the subject, First Things First. Turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, will you please? While you're turning to Matthew chapter 6, I'll send you a list of these tapes. We have more than 190 listed. And you can select whichever one you choose, or more than one. We send these tape out in appreciation for a gift of $3. Uh, $3 each, and the gift is used to help pay for our radio time and other expense connected with our radio ministry. We'll also be glad to include our brochure for the Holy Land Tour. If you request it, we're going to Israel and Rome, Mount Hermon, and other great places, the Lord willing, next March. And so if you'd like to go, if you're interested, then just request the brochure. We'd be glad to talk with you about it or send you a brochure and like you any way we can pertaining to this trip. Now I hope you have your Bible open at Matthew chapter 6. My mailing address, remember, is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Now, Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Why take ye thought for the raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like unto one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye? O oh, ye of little faith. Therefore, take no thought for saying, What we shall eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now notice verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things, the things he had mentioned there, shall be added unto you. I'm speaking today on first things first. Now in this life, there's some things that must come first and you must put first things first in order to move according to God's divine will. And my first thought is taken from the text, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Some time ago, I was talking to a man. He was up in years, I guess maybe in his 70s, and he had cancer. And I tried to win him to God. And he said, Preacher, if God will let me get well and cure me of this cancer, I'll get saved and serve Him. Now, beloved, that's no way, no way to expect God to help you. That man said, if God will let me get well and cure me of this cancer and let me live, I'll get saved and then I'll serve Him. First of all, seek ye the Lord, the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, that's the first thing you need to do. Now, if you don't do that, you might well not expect other blessings from God in the way of prayer. Because you must know God first. You must be saved first in order for God to hear your prayers and do anything about it. 
God doesn't answer prayers of lost people. They're dead in trespassing sins. Oh, a lost person might pray for something. It might come to pass. It might happen, but it would happen anyway. See, dead people cannot talk to God in prayer. The only thing they can do is come to God in repentance and pray the sinner's prayer. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, if they will come wanting to be saved, and that means they want to be saved, then God will come to their rescue. Now, after they're saved, then every promise in the Word of God belongs to them. They can talk to their Father in heaven. They can pray. They can ask God for things. And they can get answer to many of their prayers. They may have to be patient and wait upon some, but God Almighty is able to help them and answer their prayers. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I may be speaking to someone today out in the radio listening audience. You're troubled, you're perplexed because you've been asking God for things and you're not saved. You might as well forget about it. God is not going to come to your rescue and answer your prayer as an unsaved person unless you seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness. Now you get saved and after you get saved, then you can talk to God about your problems. Oh, you may say, now preach Edwards, I see, I understand why I haven't got an answer. That's it. God is not going to come to your rescue and answer your prayers as a lost person. You've got to get saved first. If any prayer that you call a prayer as a sinner has been answered for you, it would have been answered anyway. It would happen anyway because God is not obligated to answer the prayer of any sinner unless he becomes a Christian first. Get saved first of all. And then he, have, he has available all the promises in the Bible. The second one is first start at home. Now there's always a place to start serving God. After you get saved, after you seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, after God saves you, then there's a starting point. And God tells you exactly where to start. Now you listen to the word of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 4, the Bible says, If any would have children or nephews, let them first show piety at home and requite their parents, for that is good, acceptable before God. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 19, Jesus said, How be it? Jesus said to him, Not rather, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and had compassion on thee. Now here you have the story where God cast the demons out of a man that lived in the graveyard. And he wanted to go with the Lord Jesus and be with him as he traveled. Jesus was getting on the ship to cross back over the Sea of Galilee toward Capernaum. And this man wanted to go along. Now Jesus said, the first thing you need to do is go home and witness your people at home. Now your starting point is at home. There's some people you can reach in your home. There's some you cannot. Some of the easiest people that you'll ever reach for God you'll find to be in your home. And some of the hardest you ever tried to reach for God, you'll find to be in your home. Now when God saved me, I had the privilege and honor of leading some of my relatives and my wife's relatives to God. Some of them are here in the auditorium today. Some of them listening out the radio listening audience, I'm sure. I had the high honor of leading them to God. There's other of my relatives and her relatives I've never been able to touch with a 10-foot pole, as the old saying goes. I've never been able to reach them for God. Some of the easiest and some of the hardest you'll find at home. But nevertheless, Jesus said, start right there. Start in your home. Reach what you can among your home or your relatives there in your home. And then begin to reach out from there. Some of them you can reach. Some of them you cannot. So you must keep that in mind. But you start at home. That's the place to start serving God is to start at home. A lot of people say they're saved, but when they go home, they act like the devil. Beloved, listen to me. You need to serve God in the home as well as any other place. There's a preacher, one preacher's wife one time made this statement. She said at home, I think my husband, the pastor, should never enter the pulpit. But when he gets in the pulpit, I think he should never come out of the pulpit. Now, beloved, listen to me. You need to live at home. If you act pious at church and then go home and live like the devil, you're not going to get anything accomplished in your home. You're acting hypocritical. Your, your family won't have any confidence in you. You can come at home and smile bigger than Jimmy Carter ever smiled and go home and frown up and be as mean as the devil and you'll get nowhere for God. 
Now, if you're going to smile at home, then smile, smile in the church, smile at home. If you're going to be pious in the church, be pious at home. If you're living for God in the church, live for God at home. That's what he's talking about. He said, go home and there, live for God there. That's why you start. That's number one. Then we come to thought number three, and that is, first, count the cost. Do you want to be used of God and blessed of God? Would you like to have reward in heaven? Would you like for Jesus to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant? Then if you do, sit down and count the cost. This way of serving God is not an easy way. It's not always a mounting top. You run into problems on your job. You run into problems in your community. You run into problems in your home. You run into problems everywhere you go as a Christian. You're not always going to have everything to go right. Now, if you are not willing to pay the price, count the cost, then don't expect God's best for you and don't expect to be fully rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28, for which of you intend to build a tower, sit it not down first and count it the cost, for they are sufficient to finish it. A man that's going to build a tower, they built many towers in those days because they had no way of communication from one village to another except as they carried it by foot or by a uh, camel or on donkey back as they ride back and forth. And they had to protect their little uh, villages and they'd build a tower and a wall around their village. Somebody would remain in that tower as a watchman and he could see a long way. And if he saw someone coming toward their little village that looked like it might be an army from some other little nation coming in to conquer them, then he would give forth a sound out the warning. But they had to build those towers. Now Jesus said, what man will sit down and say, I'm going to build a tower and start building that tower and not have enough material or money to finish it? What man would build a house? He says, I'm going to build a house and only have about half enough money to build it. What person would start out in battle in an army, Jesus said, to fight the enemy unless he first sit down and figure out how many soldiers he's got as to whether he has enough to win the battle? Beloved, listen to me. We've got to count the cost. If you want God's best for you and you will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ, you better count the cost. There's a price to be paid and be willing to pay that price. And so you must first count the cost. Number four, you must be first in soul winning. Now you need to start out witnessing first of all. As a Christian, start out witnessing, winning souls to God. I shall never forget the first man I have a one to God. I won't take time to tell you about it today. I've told you about it in days gone by. That thrilled me. I could hardly sleep that night to know I'd won that man to God. And then as I won others to God, it thrilled me so back in the early years of my sojourn for God. It just thrilled me to the heart to win somebody to God. One of the greatest thrills that you'll ever get out of serving the Lord Jesus Christ it's to know you have won somebody to God. And did you know there's somebody you can win to the Lord? Oh, you say now, preacher Edwards, I, I can't win anybody to God. Yes, you can. There's somebody you can win to God. You haven't tried hard enough. Keep on trying. There's somebody you can win to Jesus Christ. A few years ago, we had a couple of young preachers here in our church. I wanted them to win somebody to God. I found a man here in the community that was just right. Just like a ripe fruit ready to fall from the tree. I knew that man could be one to God. I could have won him to God. But I didn't. You know what I did? I stood right here in front of this church. When these two young preacher boys came up, I said, Boys, would you like to win somebody to God? They said, We sure would. I, I said, You go to a certain house. I pointed out. I said, There's a man there. I believe you can win to God. They took off. And they came back shouting and praising God and rejoicing. They said, Preacher, thank God, amen. Said, we won him to Jesus. Said, he got saved. And they were so thrilled and thrilled me because it thrilled them. I could have won the man. I'd want them to do it because I knew what it would do for them. Now, when you win one soul to God, it's like getting a taste of blood. You'll go after another. And the more you win, the more you want to win. And the greatest thrill you'll ever get is winning somebody to Jesus Christ personally. That is somebody you know that you definitely want him to God. Now in the Bible says in John chapter 1 verses 40 and 41. One of the two which heard Jesus speak followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finds his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah which has been interpreted to Christ. Now here we find Andrew was following Jesus before he started out 
the Bible said he first went back and won his brother uh, Simon Peter, told him about Jesus. He first went and told his brother by winning his brother to the Lord. Andrew did that. That was first in his life, and then he continued following the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's always somebody you can win. First of all, start out trying to win somebody. Then we come to thought number five, and that's first in honoring God on the first day of the week. That's a day that's been set aside uh, since the early church where Christians worship. Back in Old Testament days, they worshiped on Saturday, which was the old Sabbath. That was a Jewish Sabbath. Now when the new era began, the era of Christianity, God changed that day from Saturday until Sunday. Now Sunday is the first day of the week, not the last day. Saturday is the last day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. God said, now I want you to honor me first. Let me have the first day of the week of your life. I want that day wherein I can, uh, you can worship, you can come to my house and worship. Let me have that day. And from that time until now, Christians have been meeting on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, to worship God. Now, there used to be a time they never opened stores and places of amusement on the Lord's day. They closed them up and they honored God on that day. Now, today, everything seems to be wide open and going wild in the way of the world. And people dishonor God. But Christian people still need to honor God on the Lord's day. Now your place is to be in the house of God on the Lord's day. Not over on the lake somewhere. Not up in the mountains. Not going over to St. Susan's or Uncle John's. Your place is in the house of God on the Lord's day. The Bible says as the custom of the Lord was, they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. The apostles went into the place of worship on the Sabbath. And then when they started worshiping on the first day of the week, they would meet on the first day of the week. They went to church. They believed in honoring God on the Lord's day. As a Christian, you're obligated to honor God on his day. Now, you can understand why these sinners will get out here, run their business on Sunday, uh, take off and work on Sunday when they don't have to, get out and build and cut grass and all that kind of stuff on Sunday when they don't have to. They just don't know anything about real good, true Christianity. They don't honor God. Now, Christian people should honor God, rest on the Lord's day, worship on the Lord's day. That's the first day of the week. And then if you'll do that, You'll be feeling good to go out and serve God the rest of the week. So put God first. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in storm as God's prospered him. God said the first day, not the second, not the third, but the first day. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now the Lord's day is the first day of the week. On Sunday, you ought to be in God's house you shouldn't let anything hinder you unless you're sick and absolutely providentially hindered. Many churches are suffering today because of deadhead church members that don't care anything about God or the house of God. They just as soon go some other place and sit at home as to be in God's house and they're gradually killing their church in that respect and answer to God for it. It's the responsibility of every church member that's born again do his part or her part in being found faithful and being in the house of God on the Lord's day. That is your responsibility and God will hold you accountable for that. Then we come to number six. That's first take, in, take the beam out of your own eye before you try to get the moat out of your brother's eye. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 verses 4 and 5, Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly how to cast the moat out of thy brother's eye. Now a moat is a little tiny particle of dust. A real small little tiny particle of dust. That's a moat. Now a beam. How many people know what a beam is? I might as well shut my Bible and go home. Don't even know what a beam is. Got one man knows what a beam is. A beam is that building, that thing that goes across the building to hold up the building. That's a beam. Now you know what a beam is? All right, fine. I won't do that. I'll just stay here and preach on since I've told you what it is. But anyway, a beam holds up the building. Now the Bible said here, don't try to go and take a little piece of dust out of your brother's eye when you got a beam sticking in your own eye. He tells us so here in the Word of God. And you find, find a lot of church members that got beams in their eyes and they want to take the dust out of their brother's eye. Now Jesus said, get that beam out of your own eye 
and then you can take the dust out of your brother's eye, that little particle, and you see clearly how to do it. How can you see a little particle in your brother's eye with a big beam sticking in your own eye? That's what Jesus told me. He said, first of all, get that beam out. Get that beam out of your own eye. Then we come to the next thought, and that is first in judging self. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. And then it's in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, but why does thou judge thy brother? Or why does thou set it not thy brother? Or why should, or we should all go to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. 1 Corinthians 11, 31, for if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. What is he saying here? What is the Lord trying to tell us? Now, a lot of us like to sit in Moses' seat and judge everybody else. But God said, number one, first of all, judge yourself. We are to judge ourselves. That's number one. Do you want to know who the person is that gives you the most trouble? Do you? The person that gives you the most trouble, the person that you need to judge, number one. If you don't know who that person is, go home look in the mirror when you get home. And you'll spot him. He'll be right there looking at you when you look in the mirror. That's the first person that you need to judge. The Bible said judge yourself. A lot of people want to sit in Moses' seat. Moses was a judge. They want to sit in his seat and judge Israel. He, he judged Israel. Now God said for us to judge ourselves and will not be judged. Our responsibility, number one, is to check up on ourselves first of all before we try to check up on others. There's a man one time preaching away and he's talking about uh, people being perfect. And he said, uh, there's nobody uh, perfect but the Lord. And, and one woman uh, raised, one man raised uh, his hand. He said, uh, brother, you have something to say? He said, yes, sir. I know a perfect person. And the preacher said, you mean you know of a man that's perfect? He said, I sure do. He said, will you please tell me who he is? He says, my wife's first husband. Now, beloved, we need to realize that nobody is really perfect. We might be deceived and fool ourselves, but nobody is perfect but the Lord Jesus Christ. But God wants us to strive in that direction. Amen? amen. All right, thank you for one of them. And so uh, if we get more than one amen, that'll help me out here a little bit. Okay, judge yourself, the Bible says. Now, come the next one. That is first in getting clean the inside. Now, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're like a, a graveyard. Those Pharisees, you know, they'd go out and they'd whitewash those tombstones. They'd say, this is old Elijah. I'm not, not Elijah, but he didn't go to the graveyard. But old Elisha and, and this is old Ezekiel and so forth. They'd go out and, and polish those cemeteries. And they'd polish the tombstones of those people, those prophets that had been killed in Old Testament times. They said, oh, if we'd have been living back in his day, we certainly wouldn't have killed this man. He was a great prophet. And then they turned right around and killed the prophets of their day. Did you know we have men today that go to the pulpit? That's Methodist people that go to the pulpit, brag on John Wesley. And if John Wesley was alive today, they wouldn't let him in their church. They wouldn't let anybody preach for that preach like John Wesley. Beloved, we have men today that brag on Dwight L. Moody. But you know there's not many uh, pastors today in big shot churches will let Moody come in and preach in their pulpit. They brag on the men of old that's done the job and turn around and criticize the one that's doing the job now. That's what Jesus is talking about. He said, clean up on the inside and then you can take care of the outside. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 26. Thou blind Pharisees, clean first that which is within uh, the cup and the platter, that the outside may be clean also. The Bible said the way to be clean, pure and holy is to get up, cleaned up on the inside first. All evil things come from within first. Clean up the inside first and then you can clean up the outside. A lot of people like an Easter egg look pretty on the outside but could be rotten on the inside. Now we need to realize that the inside need to be cleaned up first and the outside will take care of itself. Then we come to the next thought and that is first get right with thy brother when you bring your offering to the altar. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 23 and 24, therefore... If thy bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled thy brother, and then come and bring your altar, your gift to the altar. In those days, they did it different, what we do it now. But what he's saying is, if you're sitting in the church, mad as the devil with somebody, or they're angry at you, and they have done you wrong, you have done them wrong, then he said, get straightened out. Get straightened out among yourselves. Get straightened out with your brother or your sister 
And then you can offer things to God. There's been many of the church paralyzed because of people fall out with each other in the church, get mad at one another. Christians shouldn't do that. Beloved, you shouldn't uh, uh, be angry with your brother or your sister in the church. You should love one another, the Bible tells us. And if you have all against your brother, he has all against you. Then you get reconciled with your brother and get that straightened out. And then you can move on for God. We move the next thought and that is take care of God's servant first. Now I started to leave this point out. I said, no, I'm going to preach it because people understand it's the word of God. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 13, And God said unto her, Fear not, go and do as I said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. I'll explain that in a moment. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, 18, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially also which labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture says, Thou shalt not most out the truth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. Now let me explain this. In 1 Kings, Elijah went to a widow woman's house. He asked her for some food. She said, we have just a little meal and a little oil. I'm about ready to build a fire and cook that for me and my son. And we're going to eat that and die. That's all we got. We have no hope of getting any more, anything else to eat. That's the last. We'll eat that and die. Elijah, the man of God, said, listen, lady, go in there and cook that cake out of that little meal and oil you have and cook me a cake first. And bring me a cake and then cook all you want for you and your son. She went in and she cooked him a cake first. And then she had enough meal and oil. The last her after the famine was over. God took care of her need. Now what is being said here? They took care of the man of God first. Now the man of God is to be taken care of. A lot of people take care of him last. But he to be taken care of first of all. If you had an ox that pulled the cart. And you kept building on your cart and shining your cart and starve your ox to death. Who's going to pull the cart? So the preachers will be taken care of first of all and then take care of the other things. That's the Bible. And the Bible says he's, he's worthy of double honorarium. That is, if the preacher makes twice as much as you think he ought to make, that's all right, the Bible said. He deserves it because he's preaching the word and the truth and it's all right and honorable for him to have a good income. And if he has twice as much as you think he ought to have, then that's all right. Most of them have about half as much as they should have. They may, may have, some have equal enough to take care of themselves. Some may have more. But the Bible said if he had double, then don't fuss and quarrel about it because God said he'd take care of the situation. And then the next thought is, first give of your fruits unto God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord thy substance and the first fruit of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall bur burst out with new wine. Put God first in your Christian giving. The first part of your income belongs to God, not to leftovers, not what you decide that you might want to give Him. When you get your paycheck, the first thing you ought to do is take out God's tithe first. That belongs to the Lord. And then in addition to that, if you want to give offerings, well and good, God bless you for it. But you owe God, that's God's tithe, that's not yours. Take that out first and, and place it where it should be to the glory of God. Now listen to me. Beloved, you give you the first fruits of your income to support the gospel. God tells you, that I have never yet, now listen to this, I have never yet in my ministry, I've been preaching 43 years, I have never developed and made a strong, good Christian out of any person that refused to tie their income. It's just about an impossibility. They're just not going to grow in grace and knowledge. They're not going to do much for God. You just can't, absolutely cannot Make a spiritual, strong, stalwart Christian out of them. They're just not going to grow. They have resented Christian giving. They're going to take God's money. They're going to steal and rob. God said they rob him of the tithes and offerings. They take that, don't belong to, they spend on themselves. And then they expect God to come to their rescue in time of need. If you want God to do for you what ought to be done, come to your rescue in time of need, you take care of God's business and God will help you take care of your business. You ignore God and His business, God just lets you alone when you have problems, lets you work them out yourself. Nine times out of end, you're going to come out on a small end of the horn. But if you'll put God first, honor God, God will help you to solve your problems. Now, if you don't believe that'll work, you ought to try it. You ought to try it. It will work. And then finally, we're to do our first works for God. Revelation chapter 2, 5. Remember that for which I have fallen and repent. Do the first works or else I will come to thee quickly and remove the candlestick out of his place except I repent. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 15, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God wants us to walk in our first love, in our first works. You know how you serve God when you first got saved? That's what he's talking about. Serve God now like you did when you first got saved. But most of us kind of dwindle away from that first work of love. And uh, that's not pleasing to God. We all need to serve God like we did when we first got saved. I've told you today how to put first things first. And if you set things in order, put first things first in your life, you're going to find out you come out on the big end of the horn. Now, I challenge you to do it. If you don't believe it, you ought to try it and you see that it works. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father, today we've tried to tell the people how to put first things first and honor thee. God, you said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things to be added unto thee. God, help us to put first things first. Use this message here in this auditorium. Use it, our Father, out in the radio listening audience, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Debbie play us a stanza. So if you're here, you want to come to God, come back to God, join the church, or come here for any reason, feel free to come while I wait just a moment. Would you come? If God is speaking to your heart, would you come? She's going to play through a stanza.